Yeah, let's now talk a bit about uh, the treatment of cases. So how we deal with a value-added tax case in GEM law. Here you see a small overview of what we have to talk about. And uh, in this video, we will concentrate first on preparatory steps. So what you first try to find out before you work on the case. Um, so here's again the learning objectives. Again, clearly what you have to learn here is how to deal with the case. So what is the right approach, or the strategy or technique or the um, testing scheme, how to deal with such cases? Well, the first recommendation I can give you for a German value added tax case is that you, before you begin to solve them, or as a preparation to solve them, concentrate on three different questions in the sequence in which we name them just now. The first question is who does something for whom? So which person is active for which other person? So this is usually identical, not in theory, but in practice. Who has concluded a contract with which other person. The second question is then what specifically happened between these persons? And this um, can be split up in two sub questions. The first question is what is happening between these two persons? Is it one single transaction or is it a set of multiple transactions so that you have to treat them separately? Um, the underlying principle is the principle of unity of or uniformity of a single transaction. And um, in that context, you ask yourself, if it's a single transaction, um, what is the main element? So the thing which counts for um, its treatment. And which elements are rather ancillary, so which do not count and just accompany the main element without having any own significance. Let's begin first with the nice question, who does something for, something for somebody else? My recommendation would be make a small sketch that shows you how the relationship is so that you clearly see that in front of you and take great care that you always arrange the sketch in the same way so that um, the person who does something and the person for whom it is do done are always presented in the same way because otherwise later you will be confused. Um, preparing a case makes sense only if after the preparatory steps, you don't have to think over all these things again, but can clearly see them in a simple way in front of you. Otherwise, you would have to read the effect, the description of the case, always a second time and a third time, and that would be a waste of time. So the entrepreneur should be left. That's the person who is going to do something for the other person. And then the customer is on the right. In principle, there is no reason why I do it this way. You could also um, exchange the both sides, entrepreneur on the right, customer on the left. That's a question of personal taste. But you should, under all circumstances, do your sketch always in the same way. Because otherwise, you will be um, confused. Now, if you have found that out, the second question is, between these two parties of a contract, if more than only one thing is done, the next question has to be, is it only one thing or is it a multitude of different things which are done? Um, so how can we find that out? If it is a multitude of different things, you have not only one case, but you have two, three, or four transactions which you have to test. 
if it comes out, all this is only one transaction from the perspective of value added tax, then you have to test only that one transaction. And here you see if you make an error at that step, then um, perhaps you waste time because you test four transactions which do not exist instead of the one transaction which really exists. Or if it's four transactions and you test only one, then you test one case which does not exist really because that transaction which you assume does not exist and you lose the points for four cases which really exist. So it's a very central question. It can ruin everything if you make things wrong here. So what decides about um, if something is several steps or if it is a single complex transaction where all the uh, elements belong together and can't be separated so that you have only one case. Well, the basic principle is unity or uniformity of a supply. Um, the idea is something is a uniform and single supply if the elements which are there only make sense when they are combined from the perspective of an average customer. Uh, in that case, that is only one single transaction. So what belongs together has to be tested together. Now that is not really helpful because it shifts the problem. Now you have to ask, well, what, how can I find out what belongs together and what would not belong together from the perspective of an average customer? Well, and the answer is things which an average customer would also be willing to buy from different suppliers form two different transactions. So can you imagine that instead of buying two things from that one single entrepreneur, it would make no huge economic difference if the customer separated the uh, two elements and bought both from different persons. Um, by the way, if your customer really buys from two separate suppliers, that is the proof that things are separate and that you have two transactions. So that problem with the uniformity or non-uniformity of a supply can only arise in, question, in cases where um, the two same parties do more than one thing for each other. So, yeah. The decisive thing is to repeat that if an average customer would want to receive the, all the things which the other person does, the entrepreneur does for him or her, come in a combined way and would not like to separate them. It would not be regarded as the same thing or equivalent to order them from different suppliers. Yeah. Um, so, we are going to talk about the details there later with examples or so. But imagine, um, and now you found out several elements form only one uniform transaction, then you must know what is done here. Because sometimes you have special rules for special transactions like selling chocolate, um, offering insurance uh, contract. And so there we have special rules. And if that is now chocolate or if that is an insurance contract the goods apply if it's something different they don't apply so you must for example know what is selling chocolate and what becomes something else imagine if you own a vending machine and that machine gives a plastic cup to the customer which is then filled with cappuccino then it's clear from the whole situation. Nobody would buy the uh, plastic cup in another vending machine to the left or right of that first vending machine. Um, it belongs together. So um, 
the average customer would not be willing to see to buy the coffee without the cup because otherwise you would probably see the coffee running out of the vending machine into nowhere and now we have to decide well if that is a single transaction is it the sale of a plastic cup or is it the sale of a drink with cappuccino so with more than 75 percent milk and it would be covered by the German reduced rate of 7%. Or is it alternative C, something completely different? Neither the first nor the second alternative. That is highly relevant for determination of the tax, pay, uh, tax rate here. Um, that shows you if you do only one thing, you must know what specifically you are doing. So you might find it out. And this can be seen as step number three in the preparation of a case solution. So you should form an idea what's going on. Um, when you do only one thing for the customer, that's easy to solve, usually. If there is a combination of elements which you do for the customer, and they form a unity that's probably a bit more difficult but in principle you have that step number three in all cases okay. so if we sum that up the steps which you have to think about is first before you begin with the case solution who has a contract with which other person then if more than one thing happens between the two parties which you have sketch down now is it one single uniform transaction or is it several separate transactions so do i have one case or two or three then what is exactly what is done here is it selling a coffee is it selling a cup is it something completely different these are the questions which you have to answer before you can start a case now let's talk about the uh, last step a bit more lengthily identifying what it is what one does well if you have um, things which you do for your customer then there are always or very often certain minor elements of the transaction which are only performed in order to make the customer happy to make the main purpose or aim of the transaction easier to be done or fulfill. For example, imagine our example with the cup of coffee in the vending machine. The plastic cup is not what the customer really wants. But um, the plastic cup is falling down from the vending machine because without the plastic cup, the main purpose of the whole transaction, I want to buy a drink of coffee or cappuccino would not be able to happen to be performed properly imagine you are at the vending machine the coffee drips out without a cup then and you try to catch it with your hands then the consequences are rather drastic first you burn your hands and afterwards you burn your face that explains why the plastic cup is there once you have had the drink, you throw it away and don't think about it. At least the average customer. If you are a messy, things are strange and different. But the problem is, for tax law, average customer counts. So even if you were a messy, you still had only the coffee, the drink, which matters during the transaction, because the view of the average customer counts so this is what you can find out here sometimes things are done not just to make the main purpose more easy to fulfill imagine another example an entrepreneur sells a machine to a customer and now the problem is how will the machine come to the customer the customer has to come to 
fetch the machine. Um, that must be decided always. You can't make a bending contract, a sales contract, and then say, um, we don't agree on where the machine has to be um, handed over to the customer. So our entrepreneur here is nice and also takes the obligation to transfer the machine to the customer's address. That's a very frequent uh, approach. So the contract between the entrepreneur and the customer has two elements. First, you need to transfer ownership from the machine uh, of the machine from the entrepreneur to the customer. Plus, you have to perform a transport of the machine to the point where it has to be handed over to the customer. This is evidently a uniform transaction because it's a logical necessity that if you sell a good, you have to bring it to the place where it has to be handed over. It's not possible to separate these things. And it's also clear the customer would not like to buy this separately, okay. um, at least in these circumstances here. From these two obligations which our entrepreneur has, the transportation to the agreed destination is definitely not the main element. It is just an element which is necessary so that the main aim, I want to become the owner of this machine, that the main aim of the contract can be fulfilled, um, transfer of ownership. So the transport has a minor importance. The decisive element is I want to buy the machine. And only for that reason, we need the transport. Such elements of a transaction which only have the purpose to make the fulfillment of the main element of the contract possible are more convenient are called ancillary elements or ancillary transaction elements or ancillary services whatever you call them but the decisive thing is they have a minor importance and um, as ancillary elements have no own importance for the transaction they will be completely ignored when the transaction under VAT law has to be evaluated or checked for tax purposes. So ancillary elements do not count, not at all. Um, once they have been identified as ancillary elements, you can ignore them. For example, once you have found out what you bought, the cup of coffee, that's only the drink. The plastic cup doesn't count, then you can completely ignore the plastic cup. Huh? The only thing which happens is delivery of a drink of coffee or cappuccino, whatever you bought there. Once you have found out that the sale of the machine consists of transferring the ownership and transporting or to the destination and that the transport is only an ancillary element, you can completely cross out, eliminate, ignore, forget the transport element and concentrate yourself only on the main element, selling a machine. So the only thing which happens then between the two parties, which is relevant for VAT purposes, is delivery of a machine, transport, can be forgotten completely. Well, that ancillary elements of a transaction can be completely ignored means that everything which you pay is from the perspective of VAT always paid for the main element. Um, that does not change if the parties indulge in applied psychology and charge additional prices for these ancillary elements. Even if you have a choice, an ancillary element does not count everything that you pay for it is a part of the payment for the main element. For example, um, If even the vending machine has a button where you can renounce on getting the plastic cup and instead then um, 
the price for the coffee drink drops down to 90 cents instead of one euro. You could draw now the conclusion that if, because you have a choice between getting the plastic cup or not, a plastic cup would no longer be an ancillary element, but that's wrong. Still, when you don't dis have a cup at hand at the moment and you want to buy a coffee, you press the button that you also want the plastic cup and then you pay one euro. But it still remains true that you are not really interested in the plastic cup. The plastic cup is under these circumstances necessary for you to buy the drink. Otherwise, you remember burnt hands, burnt faces. So um, this shows you, I hope, in a burning way that um, even then the plastic cup would remain an ancillary element. So if you get an extra charge for it, that doesn't change its character as ancillary. Um, the same with the machine. If the machine is sold for a price of 100,000 euro and the seller then says, I charge you additional 10,000 for the transport. This does not change the economic reality. The transport of a good which you buy is, if the seller organizes the transport, only an ancillary element of that sale. So everything which you can buy, that you pay in combination with that, or in connection with that transaction is the gross price for the machine. If so, that means you pay 110,000. So that is the price only for the main element. That this gross price is then split up to make it more agreeable to you um, or for psychological reasons or what else. For If you then declare or explain in the invoice price for the machine, charge for the transport, extra charge because delivery date is a Tuesday, arbitrary um, additional amount in order to make customer angry or whatever you write on the invoice as additional entries at the end. Everything which belongs together can only will have one price and this one price is only paid for the main element for nothing else. So keep in mind if you have you have main elements of a transaction and ancillary elements. And the ancillary elements completely cease to exist once you have found them out and everything which is charged to you is paid for the main element. That is the view of value at detection. And that is right. It can't depend, um, it can't influence the tax treatment how two people involved try to sell or mask what they really do to the public, to the fisc, or to themselves. Well, imagine a painter comes and paints your house. Um, what you want is the painting my house. That is what you really want. Now when the painter comes, the painter will charge you with the most interesting fees. Um, time for arriving, time for erecting well, the, the construction which he or she needs to paint your house to climb up. And so um, money for a charge for the paint which was used, a charge for working late, or a charge for working on Sunday. You didn't like, want to buy all these things. You only were interested in paint my facade and under which pretext your painter charges you for that additional element additional prices that does not count so everything which is charged is economically paid as consideration for the thing which you really wanted paint my facade hmm? so that is something which you must know now let's think about the reversal of that rule. 
Imagine you find out an element of a uniform transaction is not an ancillary element, then it's necessarily a main element. So it's counting. Huh? And uh, a main element cannot be ignored. So hmm. what does that mean? Important conclusion. If now a uniform transaction contains two main elements or even more main elements, then the resulting transaction is no longer identical with only one of these main elements. Instead, you have produced a new kind of product for which you use these two main elements in order to produce it and create something new. So like raw material, two raw materials, wood and nails. If you sell wood, you sell wood. If you sell nails, you sell nails. But if you add the two together and create a desk, um, then you have created a different thing. Uh, by the way, that was a bad example, because if you construct a desk, the nails would probably be an ancillary element, because the customer would probably never care about the nature, uh, number, and other things of the nails, but forget about it. Um, imagine, to, to go back to our standard examples, if now our vending machine issues a plastic cup, to contain the fluid and then they hold chocolate. The plastic cup is ancillary element and is ignored. Um, there are only hot chocolate remains. So now we buy hot chocolate. And so it's a delivery of hot chocolate. If now you say, uh, we change it. The vending machine fills in hot chocolate plus a shot of rum. And the rum is not an ancillary element, but a main element too. And the drink, which you then get, is no longer chocolate, but it has been changed. Imagine if somebody wants to buy chocolate with rum inside. Um, in slang in Germany called Lumumba, I don't know why. Um, but then if only chocolate would be delivered, you would be angry. This is not what you ordered. And uh, so something different has been produced. And so you will not be able to apply the tax rate for hot chocolate for that new different product. Although chocolate is one element, one raw material, which was used to produce the new product. Uh, I think that can, should be okay. Or imagine married couple goes to a restaurant, takes a dinner there, and they want to celebrate their 25th anniversary of their marriage. Well, so they might order steaks and wine, and there will be a nice atmosphere, and they expect that everybody serves them well and is highly polite. Um, yeah, these elements necessarily form a unit from the way view of an average customer. Make the test. Could you imagine it happens that they separate that so that the married couple goes to a restaurant, sits down there, wants to enjoy the service, and then when the waiter comes and says, what do you want to eat and drink, tells the waiter, yeah, we just want to sit here and enjoy the nice atmosphere. We are going to pay you for that with a bit, but we prefer to order our meal from Liverando or from... <sighs> somebody else from a McDonald's delivery service. Um, I can't imagine an average customer likes that. Uh, so you see a restaurant visit, all the elements necessarily belong, to get, belong together, even if on the invoice you get the explanation for the total charge. Steak, beer, wine, Coke, salad desert, and so on. But you could never separate that. And now let's think about um, the main elements. The food is naturally a main element. I can't imagine to sit in a restaurant and the waiter says, okay, nice to have you here. We are going to serve you well. By the way, every food is out. 
Um, can't imagine that. Also, the drinks are main element, but also the service and the atmosphere are main element in most restaurants. I can't conceive a situation where a married couple wants to celebrate a marriage, an anniversary of a marriage, and then goes to some, how can I call it, there is no name for this kind of restaurant, where the service is an insult and the atmosphere is ugly. Hmm? Um, imagine, for example, you go there to celebrate that, you go to a restaurant, you expect e excellent service and the prices are high, and then the service goes absolutely wrong, the waiter is a catastrophe, um, is unwashed, offends you in an objective way, and um, everything goes completely wrong, the whole evening is spoiled, then probably a judge would say you do not need to pay the invoice, either not, either fully not, or at least you get a major um, discount, which they must offer you because and we can even talk about damages. Um, so from this test, you can see service in such a situation cannot be only an ancillary element. And uh, yeah, why is that important? Now, food plus service is no longer food and no longer service only. We get something new, a new unit, because we have found out it's one thing only. And it's neither food, because it's more, nor service, because it's more than service. Something else which matters comes on top. So we have something new and we probably need a new name for that restaurant visit, for example. The importance of that lies in the question or in the fact that there are special rules which perhaps apply to the delivery of food. Reduced rate, for example, when often in very much cases in Germany. But these special rules no longer apply when we have no longer to do with delivery of food. But something else. Now, the rules for food mention only delivery of food, but they don't mention that other product, restaurant visit. So for a restaurant visit, these rules no longer apply. This is the reason why in Germany, if you go to a takeaway restaurant, where you can also sit down, I want to avoid to name the name of McDonald's or Burger King or the other things there, but it's always the same drama there in Germany. If you order something, they ask you, are you going to take it away? If so, it's only a delivery of food, 7% rate. Or are you going to sit down here and enjoy our excellent rooms, the perfect atmosphere and the surroundings and the excellent non-service, which is not molesting you? Um, because then this bundle is something new and will be 19%. Because it's no longer the mere delivery of food and that makes a real difference. Think again of the Mappuccino example. Um, you take a cup from plastic, ancillary element, you know, and fill in milk. Now, if that stays this way, what you deliver is milk. Now you pour in the coffee. Uh, and what you deliver now is neither milk nor coffee powder, but now it has become cappuccino, which is definitely no longer milk, although milk was used during its production. So there's a difference. And so the rules for milk can no longer apply for the delivery of a cappuccino. No? The two main elements mixed automatically make the final thing different from the original one, from the raw materials. That's something which you can observe everywhere in the world, but it's very difficult to, to see that plainly. No? Or another example, imagine a bakery gets an order from a customer. I want to get a cake which must contain a huge amount of chocolate. 
At best, it should consist only of chocolate. Here's a recipe, make a cake. Now the chocolate uh, is used for the finished product, although what you buy is no longer chocolate. What you get is a cake. Um, so you would have to check if the tax reduction, 7% rate, is for chocolate or for chocolate plus products produced mainly from chocolate or so. Or chocolate plus products containing a minimum amount of chocolate or if it's only for chocolate because what you bought here is a cake and no longer chocolate you know, because there is more um, you can even illustrate to yourself the logical implications of having more than one main element if you think of mathematics and of a mathematical formula for example a plus B is only the same as A if B is zero. Now translate that into the world of value added tax. If an element A is accompanied by another element B, then the result can no longer can only be called B if B has the value of zero. And that means if you sell chocolate plus something else. It remains only chocolate if that something else has the value of zero for value added tax if it can be ignored and things which can be ignored for value added tax are only ancillary elements main elements cannot be ignored so let's make the test if you sell chocolate plus the aluminium foil covering it plus a paper in which is wrapped and a receipt for your payment. You get all that together. This is uh, not separable, uniform transaction. But then if you look to the details, the aluminum foil covering the chocolate is an ancillary element. You throw it away. It's just covering the chocolate for, high, for hygiene reasons. The same, the paper, the receipt for your payment is um, for the accounting department or for tax purposes or so, but you don't really want it. So all these three things are ancillary elements. You can ignore them. So you cross them out and what remains is chocolate. So what has been sold here was chocolate, chocolate and only chocolate. And now we have a 7% rate for chocolate and you can apply it. If you let a room to a tenant for a monthly rent, what you do is you let a room that's tax free under VAT law in Germany and in other states of the EU, at least if the tenant is a private person and um, yeah, moves in for housing purposes. Um, now imagine you change the thing a bit. You take the obligation to give somebody an office room for rent with the full equipment, including computers, printers, high-tech devices of any kind, so full service. And um, what you promised was office room with full comprehensive service, full supply of everything you need, and so. So what the customer wanted here is not only the room, but also a 24-hour service, a complete equipment with everything which might be needed, a solution for every problem which might arise and so on. So you ordered letting a room plus letting computers plus letting all other high tech devices which I might ever need plus full service on requirement. And so you insisted in getting all of this together. So the, conse the consequence might be that might become a uniform transaction. You would not split it up because here your main interest is to have one person who is responsible to do everything you need. This is what you really want, a complex service. Now, if that's a uniform thing, uh, you will probably find out that all the other things apart from letting the room are not ancillary. Ancillary things are the things you could perhaps renounce them. They don't matter, but here they matter. 
this was just something which you also absolutely would insist on. Huh? If there something is missing, uh, you would probably complain. You would say, I have a right to a full service, so solve my problem. And if you don't solve it, this is not a trifle. This is something special. If that happens again, I bring you to court and I complain. No? So in that case, letting a room is no longer given here, but you have created something new. Full, um, full service for office tenants or so. No? Um, another thing which people sometimes misunderstand is that an ancillary element in one contract is not always the same as an ancillary element in another contract. From the one perspective, what is ancillary between the two of us might be the main element in my contract with somebody else. For example, if the person who sells our machine to um, the customer takes the obligation to transfer the ownership of the machine plus hand the machine over to the customer in Moscow, in Russia. Then in that contract, the two things belong together. They are a uniform transaction. And in that contract, the transfer is an ancillary element because the transport alone does not really matter to the customer. The customer is interested in the machine, wants to get the machine, and the transport is just necessary to make the transfer of ownership in the machine more convenient or even possible at all. So the ancillary element, the transport doesn't matter here in that contract. Now the vendor perhaps has no interest in driving the machine um, to Moscow in Russia himself. So he passes on that task to do the transport to a forwarding agent to Holya uh, and says, bring that machine to Russia. Here's the address. Uh, ring the bell, hand it over, get a confirmation signed, and then I pay you for the transport. Now the contract here is between the forwarding agent as the entrepreneur and um, the vendor of the machine as the customer here. And now what happens between these two people here, these two people here, is the forwarding agent just has one obligation, do a transfer of a machine and nothing else. And in that contract relationship, doing the transfer is the main element. So this counts in that contract. And you see, although it is the same transfer, in the contract relationship between the vendor of the machine and the Russian customer, it does not count. There is an ancillary. But when the vendor gives a task to do the transfer to the Holia, to the forwarding agent, then in their relationship, it's the main element which that customer wants do a transfer because that is what I can't do myself. So. If two people do something, do the same thing, it may not be the same thing from the perspective of VAT, because as you saw here, in the one contract, it is a main element, in the other, it's ancillary. That happens very often. Yeah. To illustrate all that stuff again, here again, selling a bar of chocolate. What changes ownership is chocolate, a foil of aluminium covering it, wrapping paper with um, the name of the chocolate printed on top and some nice um, things which want to make it attractive for the customer and a cash receipt which you get when you pay for it. All that happens together and is a uniform um, supply. And evidently, as I see here, made a slight mistake or I bought some hot chocolate with uh, alcohol in it because this is uh, yeah enjoy it 
Now, if we analyze it, the receipt is ancillary, the wrapping paper is ancillary, the aluminium foil is ancillary, so we cross them out and only chocolate is left over, and that's 7%. Mm -hmm. If you go to a cafe, chop hot chocolate, piece of cake, serviced by the waiter. Oh, nice to see you again. <laughs> nice atmosphere. No professors around, only students. Good. The nice atmosphere might be ancillary. It might be that you would sit down there even without the nice atmosphere. It might also be a main element. That depends on the situation. But we can assume that the hot chocolate, the cake, plus the service by the waiter form a unity, and that at least the service is not absolutely ancillary. If that is the case, it's and you compare it to chocolate, then you find out it's definitely not the same as chocolate because this is now made up by other things. Chocolate plus cake plus waiter is mathematically different from chocolate. It's so easy. Okay, um, you have already seen a glance to the next topic, which is to come soon the mandatory testing scheme. So when you once prepared your case data in the way I described you just now with these three steps, then our next approach or next step will be to test the case, which you have now identified in an exactly prescribed way. That is necessary because if you make a mistake in the value-added tax evaluation of a case that can have drastic financial consequences. And um, to avoid that as much as possible, the way how you have to comment and test a case has been absolutely prescribed um, by the law and by textbooks and so on in Germany. Thanks for watching this time. I look forward to meeting you again on the channel. And well, it just remains to say goodbye till the next time. Now I have to look for a small button on my computer to press it to stop the recording. And then I can say goodbye till next time. Ciao.